I'm Harold Holzer, and I have the honor of serving as the Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House. I know all of us have felt in recent days as if we've lost a member of the family with the passing of the legendary civil rights activist and Congressman John Lewis. The good trouble that he got into during a 50 year fight for justice and equality opened doors and truly shattered ceilings. He sacrificed himself for the soul of America and we're all in his debt even as we continue the march he began to pursue a more perfect union. Eight years ago, Congressman Lewis was a guest at Roosevelt House for a panel discussion on civil rights with former mayor of San Antonio, Henry Cisneros, biographer and Pulitzer Prize winner, Taylor Branch, and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, Nick Cotts, who sadly has left us as has the Congressman since his program was aired. In tribute to John Lewis, and in the belief that his words are always worth rehearing. We're pleased to have rescued this recording from the Roosevelt House archive, and we're honored to be presenting it again now. Just a personal word before we go back to the tape. Back in 2008, I was thrilled to share a stage with John Lewis at a Queens College commencement uh, ceremony. Congressman Lewis was the official commencement speaker. It was raining so torrentially that the college all but canceled the outdoor reception that was scheduled to follow the event. And instead, uh, officials ushered both of us to the college library where they had brought out a, a really interesting trove for us to rummage through. It was the archives of Queens native Lewis Armstrong. For an hour, we got to look through his diaries, his collages, which very few people know about, and even got to hold his trumpet. There I sat to watch one icon contemplating another icon. We stayed in touch, and on February 12, 2009, I saw him sitting in a vast audience inside the Capitol Rotunda, the same grand space where he recently lay in state. It was the congressional celebration of the 200th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's birth. And as the chairman of the National Bicentennial Commission, I got to share the stage and the podium that day with Speaker Nancy Pelosi, Senator Dick Durbin, and President Obama. It's pretty exhilarating, but what happened next is kind of a long story and I will abbreviate it. President Obama got up and started his remarks with the exact anecdote that I had prepared to begin my own talk with. Um, imagine that feeling, and what are you going to do? He's the president, plus he was also speaking first. So my turn came, my turn came and um, I stood up, still without an opening, looked into this sea of 1,500 faces, and I decided to say, ladies and gentlemen, thinking about Lincoln's legacy, and the march forward to civil rights and equality since, there are many people here who have talked the talk, but there's one person in particular who walked the walk. And I just want to acknowledge Congressman John Lewis. And all of a sudden, as one, 1,500 people stood up and gave him a standing ovation as he put his hand on his heart to say thanks. Um, tears fill my eyes just thinking about that moment as they did then, uh, what a privilege it was for that moment to connect the struggles of the 19th century to the ongoing struggles of the 20th century for which John Lewis extended his work into yet another century and another millennium. So it's with that personal connection that I wanted to introduce this program. I only wish I'd been at Roosevelt House three years later when he graced our auditorium with his inspiring presence. I miss that evening. I'd like to think that along with Franklin Roosevelt, Eleanor Roosevelt, and such grand visitors to the house as Mary McLeod Bethune to the, to the Dalai Lama, his spirit still dwells in part at Roosevelt House, perhaps even communing with the Roosevelts in the solitude of the quarantine that we're all enduring now.
Thank you for letting me share my own memories of John Lewis. And please now join me in watching and listening again from March 15th, 2012, to Henry Cisneros, Taylor Branch, Nick Kotz, and the immortal John Lewis. Thanks uh, to all of you for joining us today. I'm confident that this will be a stimulating conversation on an important subject, civil rights during the Johnson years. And of course, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel uh, for joining us today. It really is an honor for all of you to be with us. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to read a historical excerpt that I think is relevant uh, to what we're going to do. Then I'll say a few words, which I hope will set the stage uh, for the conversation. Uh, this is a historical document, which I will now read from. <clears throat> Down Water Street we went, turning right and walking along the river until we reached the base of the bridge, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. I noticed how steep it was as we climbed toward the steel canopy at the top. When we reached the crest of the bridge, I stopped dead still. There, facing us at the bottom of the other side, stood a sea of blue-helmeted, blue-uniformed Alabama state troopers, line after line of them, dozens of battle-ready lawmen stretched from one side of U.S. Highway 80 to the other. While we were still about 50 feet from the troopers, the officer in charge stepped forward holding a small bullhorn up to his mouth. This is an unlawful assembly, he pronounced. Your march is not conducive to the public safety. Your order to disperse and go back to your church or to your homes. Well, we couldn't go forward. We couldn't go back. There was only one option left that I could see. We should kneel and pray. Then all hell broke loose. The troopers and posse men swept forward as one like a human wave, a blur of blue shirts and billy clubs and bull whips. Then they were upon us. The first of the troopers came over me, a large husky man, and without a word he swung his club against the left side of my head. I didn't feel any pain, just the thud of the blow and my legs giving way. Then the same trooper hit me again. I was bleeding badly. My head was now exploding with pain. There was mayhem all around me. Those are the words of John Lewis, uh, taken from his extraordinary <coughs> memoir, Walking with the Wind. And in that excerpt, he's recalling the day in March 1965, March 7th, become known as Bloody Sunday, when a group of determined and courageous black Americans decided to march from Selma, possibly to Montgomery, but they weren't sure they'd get that far. They would march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and they wanted to obtain a right that many thousands of black Southerners had been denied for generations in the era of Jim Crow, the right to vote, perhaps the most fundamental right in a democracy. And for that, they were battered by white Southerners, beaten by officers of the law. And as we consider the policies that were made in Washington during the Johnson years, because that's what we're here to do today, it's worth keeping in mind that those policies which Lyndon Johnson energetically supported and helped implement quite skillfully, those policies were propelled forward by the activities of people on the ground in places like Selma, where groups organized and marched and prayed and risked their lives so they could achieve equal treatment under the law. History unfolded as it did in that era because of the actions of regular people, of activist leaders like Congressman Lewis, and of Washington policymakers. And lest we forget, and I do think it's important to keep this in mind, there were many people on the streets of the South and in the halls of Washington who worked with great determination to make sure black Americans didn't achieve what they were seeking, and that's why the fight was so difficult. Our task today is to consider civil rights in the age of Lyndon Johnson. We want to try to understand how LBJ and those who worked with him operated, what they did, how they did it, and to what extent their policies succeeded. It seems appropriate then to begin by asking Congressman Lewis if he would paint a picture for us, a picture of life in the age of Jim Crow before this legislation was passed, and I think we want to keep in mind as he's painting that picture, uh, why it was necessary to pass federal legislation. Congressman Lewis? Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted and very happy, really honored to be here with my fellow panelists and with each and every one of you. Uh, thank you for having me. Now, I grew up in rural Alabama, about 50 miles from Montgomery, outside of a little place called Troy. 
growing up there before 1964 or 65, I, I saw those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. As a young child growing up during the 40s and the 50s and to the 60s, uh, I tasted the bitter fruits of racism and I didn't like it. I would ask my mother, my father, my grandparents, my great grandparents, why? They would say, that's the way it is. Don't get in the way, don't get in trouble. But uh, one day I heard about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King Jr. and I was deeply inspired to get in the way, to get in trouble. So for many years I've been getting in the way and getting in trouble. <laughs> I call it good trouble, necessary trouble. My mother, my father, my grandparents, and my great-grandparents could not register to vote simply because of the color of their skin. During the uh, 60s, in many parts of the American South, people had to pass a so-called literacy test, pay a poll tax, interpret certain section of the Constitution of Alabama, or Georgia, or Mississippi. The state of Mississippi in 1963-64 65 had a black voting age population of more than 450,000 and only about 16 or 18,000 blacks were registered to vote. There were one county in Alabama, Lowndes County, between Selma and Montgomery. The county had an African-American population of more than 80%, but not a single registered African-American voter. In Selma, Alabama, only 2.1% of blacks of voting age were registered to vote. Now, in 1964, when President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964, we had organized something in the state of Mississippi called the Mississippi <coughs> Summer Project, where more than a thousand young people, college students and others came there to try to prepare people to, prepare, to pass the literacy test. And three young men, two from New York City, Andy Goodman, Mika Scherner, and James Shaney, a young African-American from Mississippi, went out to investigate the burning of an African-American church. These three young men were detained by the sheriff, later arrested, taken to jail, and on that same night, they were turned over to the Klan, where they were beaten, shot, and killed. And because of what happened to them, President Johnson established an office of the FBI in Jackson, Mississippi, to investigate, and people went out to look for them. And six weeks later, their bodies were discovered buried on a, a mound of dirt. It, it was state-sanctioned violence in places like Mississippi and Alabama. And we didn't give up. We didn't become bitter or hostile. We kept our faith. We uh, kept our eyes on the prize. And we were determined somehow in some way to get the vote. I remember long before when I spoke at the March on Washington on August 28, 1963, I was reading a copy of the New York Times. I was working on my speech. And I saw a picture of a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my March on Washington speech, I said something like, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours too. It must be ours. It was unbelievable the day President Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act during the summer of 1964. He won a landslide election. I don't need to tell any of you this. And he gave us so much hope with the signing of the Civil Rights Act. Dr. King received the Nobel Peace Prize, come back to the White House, have a meeting. Some of the Johnson people know this better than I do. Had a meeting with President Johnson. And I think that's what President Johnson was saying on that tape. Sort of saying, create the climate, create the environment. In a sense, Nick, you know this. Saying, just make me do it. But he said, I just, I just signed the Civil Rights Act. We don't have the votes in the Congress to get a vote for the Rights Act. Just paint a picture. And that's what we did. That's what we did in Selma and other parts of the South. And I may be jumping ahead here, but I must say this. You know, today, 47 years ago, today, March 15, 1965, President Lyndon Johnson made one of the most meaningful speeches I think any American president had made in modern time. 
and the whole question of civil rights, the voting rights. Eight days after Bloody Sunday, he spoke to a joint session of the Congress, spoke to the American people, and he made what we call the We Shall Overcome speech. He started that speech off that night by saying, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and for the destiny of democracy. He went on to say, at time, history and fate meet on a single place in man unending search for freedom. So it was more than a century ago at Lexington and at Concord. So it was at Appomattox. And then he said, and last week, he was in Selma, Alabama. He condemned the violence in Selma, introduced the Voting Rights Act, and before he concluded that speech, he said, and we shall overcome. We shall overcome. And, the, um, you know, the, the rest is history. The rest is history. He, uh, he called out the troopers, federalized Alabama National Guard, called out part of the United States military, the army, and helped protect us on the march from Selma to Montgomery. And the Congress debated the act, and it was signed into law, passed the act, signed into law on August 6, 1960. Thanks for that uh, beginning. That's quite powerful. I'm not sure where we go from there, but um, that's very, very good. Um, I, I wanted to go back just a little bit um, and look at the, the transition. Yeah. Johnson becomes president uh, in November of 1963. Uh, he is obviously a southerner. We, we've established that here uh, the last day or so. He's from Texas. Um, how did the civil rights leadership view him? Kennedy from Massachusetts, you know, the abolitionists' legacy and all the rest, but Johnson's from the South. What were your thoughts about Lyndon Johnson when he takes office, and what did you thought, think that portended for the movement? Well, I think some, some of the people had some concern, but uh, President Johnson met with the uh, civil rights leadership, uh, met with Dr. King, uh, Roy Wilkin, uh, James Farmer, A. Philip Randolph, uh, at that time, he didn't meet with the people in, in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But the morning, uh, well, I'm jumping ahead too, um, but he stayed in church. People within his administration, within the Johnson administration, stayed in church with us. The people within the Justice Department. But President Johnson said, I'm committed to civil rights. I'm committed to see the program and the policy of President Kennedy in the whole area of civil rights through. He made that commitment. He assured us. He reassured us. Mm -hmm. That's, uh, Secretary Cisneros, can you share with us some of your thoughts on Lyndon Johnson? You're from Texas, particularly as a young man growing up, perhaps think, talk about your, his relationship with the Latino community, but what impact did he have on you when you were sort of coming First, of age? let me say I'm greatly honored to be here, humbled to be in the presence of John Lewis and uh, as an inheritor of his work and the work of the generation that walked uh, at the Edmund Pettus Bridge and many other places uh, across our country. Um, I've always thought that President Johnson was able to rise to the moment in 1960, in that period, 63, 64, because at the core was a man who couldn't abide unfairness. Exactly the words that he said on that tape earlier when he said, it's not right, it's not fair. And I suspect that some of that stems from his growing up in the Johnson City area of the hill country of Texas in a period when people didn't have electricity and the poor, poor, poor farmers. But it also stems from a period, for example, when he went and taught in a place called Catula, Texas, just south of San Antonio. And he taught uh, Mexican children in a period when discrimination against Mexicans was almost as virulent, perhaps not quite as intense as what existed in Alabama and Mississippi, but the same pattern of unable to vote without a poll tax, uh, stories of, uh, of, of, of as late as the 1940s when veterans came back from the war having uh, shared foxholes and drank from the same canteens as white soldiers, but when they came back to South Texas could not be buried in the same cemeteries in, in South Texas towns. It was that virulent a period. President Johnson did that in the early 1930s, got elected to Congress in the Depression, was a student of President Roosevelt, uh, truly a, a 
inherited the Roosevelt uh, mantle of fairness and justice and progress for the society. And it was a, an aspect of his, uh, of his leadership throughout. Um, so I'm certain that the, 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 the very core of those ideas of fairness were, were part of Lyndon Johnson for all of that period. And when, when the moment came after the assassination of President Kennedy and after the events of, of the early 1960s, he rose in a way that I think Lucy said it right in the last uh, session, um, or changed the country more profoundly than all of the other major things that he did. And there were some in, incredible things in education, in housing, um, urban affairs, uh, and so many areas. But this trilogy of civil rights, voting rights, and fair housing has made it, has changed our country in fundamental ways. As Dr. King said, when the doors of justice are opened and the water begins to flow, it touched not only African Americans, but as we know in the 50 year period since, uh, women, disabled persons, uh, Latinos, Asian Americans, gay and lesbian people. Uh, this is a fundamentally different country where people can rise to their potential because of the changes that these laws made possible. Taylor, um, you mentioned uh, Secretary Cisneros, the word trilogy, and Taylor Branch's uh, work came to mind. He's written a, a masterful trilogy on the King years. Um, tell us, uh, if you could, about a little bit about Johnson and what skills he brought to bear on this question, skills, his beliefs, attitudes, and, and more technically in the sense of being uh, someone who had spent his life, uh, spent a good part of his life in, as a senator, then he comes, he becomes president, he has to move legislation forward. How does he do that? How does he go about that? Well, he was a creature of legislation. He loved it. Dr. King came back from his first meeting saying he was astonished because all President Johnson did was talk about how to get the Civil Rights Act passed, and he didn't mention communism and subversion once, <laughs> <laughs> which, which had been, unfortunately, the predicate of every conversation he had with President Kennedy. President Kennedy was always saying, you've got to get rid of this person and watch out for that person, and we're in danger. Uh, it was a, a striking uh, difference. Uh, I, too, want to thank uh, Roosevelt House and for having me here. Uh, I'm a constituent of John, or at least my mother is, where I, my hometown. We were just together last week, and we've known each other since the 60s and known a lot of these panelists. But I've been enthralled with studying Johnson the better part of my life. And um, the speech that John quoted is one of the great pinnacle speeches of, Amer of American uh, politics. Uh, the eight days that you mentioned between Bloody Sunday and March 15th, I think, are, are like eight years. Each one of those days shows him exhibiting the skills that you were talking about. The job, that's when he had George Wallace into his office. Yes. Could you tell us about that? Oh, my Lord. <laughs> it's a great story. Well, George Wallace was playing... Did you say, did you say little George, you listen to me? <laughs> yes, <laughs> little George, and I don't know if I can say uh, everything that he said. I don't know about <laughs> First, first of all, Wallace was playing cat and mouse with trying to block the next march, and uh, there were there were a thousand clergy bottled up behind what was called the Berlin Wall, and Frank Johnson, the judge, had Dr. King uh, hamstrung, and the movement was kind of coming apart. Are we going to be able to go or not? And Johnson called Wallace up there. Are you going to protect him or not? And he. <laughs> He, with Wallace sitting in the room waiting to come in, Johnson called Nick Katzenbach into the bathroom where Johnson was relieving himself and said to, to Nick, go down there and write six things that I should ask Wallace to do. I don't give a damn what they are. He wanted to have a pocket list and then he, he, he came and sat over Wallace who sank into the, the couch. Johnson sat over him uh, with the list in his pocket and kept telling him to do these things. Go, to, go out there and say anybody can register to vote, every black child can go to school, all these impossible things, and Wallace is sitting there sputtering, and he finally said, and tell everybody that they can register to vote. And, and Wallace said, I have no influence over voting in the state of Alabama, and, and the president says, don't you shit me, George Wallace. You, you had the power to keep the president of the United States off the ballot in Alabama and gave those votes to the, to the nominee of the Republican Party. 
So don't tell me you can't tell a school principal what to do and all. So he basically intimidated him. Wallace kind of walked out and said, the president is very, very influential and persuasive when you talk to him, kind of shell-shocked, and then went back and said, I can't protect the marchers anyway, which gave Johnson the leeway to maneuver and be able to say, okay, they've admitted they can't protect the marchers. The courts have ordered the marchers to be protected. Therefore, the federal government will do that. I, I just want to make one comment on history. If everybody and you would know this, Jonathan, better than most, if every American history student, well, first of all, if American history was part of what our schools are graded on, we'd be a better country because we would teach citizenship and we would understand what it is about. If every American history student could listen to some of Johnson's phone conversations about what it is to run a people's government, um, we'd be a better country. They are an amazing resource. And to me, it is a sadness that they're not all transcribed to this day. I had to listen to all of them and quote them and type them out and quote them. They're an amazing, whether you're interested in Vietnam or civil rights or anything else, uh, they're an amazing resource. And I'm only sad that we're not mature enough as a country uh, that to be able to say every president should be able to re record their phone calls with the security that they'd be kept secret for 15 years so that over time, we could become more familiar with what it really is and what motivates presidents, because right now we have cartoon images of our presidents and their motivations when they're in office. So we know, though, from these tapes that Johnson made that this was an extraordinary public servant dealing with one of the most difficult issues uh, of all time that had befuddled the country for a century. And we need that example, of course, today as an example that we can, if we pull together and we talk about things in fundamental ways the way Johnson did, we can tackle the most intractable problems ahead of us again. Thanks. Um, uh, Nick, you have written uh, luminously about the relationship between uh, Johnson and Martin Luther King. This is, I think, one of the important key relationships in this period. Can you talk to us about that dynamic, King and Johnson meeting, phone calls and so forth, and how it um, uh, in a sense, accelerated or, or, or provided energy for the progress we're talking about. Yes, I will. But first, I want to re-emphasize your opening comments. Lyndon Johnson, Martin Luther King, Everett Dirksen, none of this would have happened except for the relentless marching of black people and some allies. The Selma was the culmination of the, of the marching of the 65 law. Birmingham in 63, where police dogs were snapping at young kids and the fire department had high pressure hoses that they were aiming at the marchers was the key to passing the 64 law. Those, the 65, when John, uh, John ended up in the hospital, um, badly hurt. But the reason that this was so powerful was because American television cameras, at that time we only had three networks, and the television cameras were focused on those two incidents and many others. And the American public reacted, and the politicians had to act, and Johnson knew how to act. Let me pick up where uh, we, we all heard Johnson telling Martin Luther King the strategy, the tactics of what you needed to do to build pressure for voting rights. And I think a phrase that wasn't in there, he said the president of the Tuskegee Institute went down to vote. And they said he couldn't pass the literacy test. And then this is what King said. This is a telephone conversation on January the 15th, 1965. It is Martin Luther King's 36th birthday, and Johnson is called to wish him happy birthday. 
This is Dr. King responding to Johnson giving him strategy and tactics. You're exactly right about that, replied Dr. King. It's very interesting, Mr. President, to notice that the only states you didn't carry in the South, the five Southern states, had less than 40% of the Negroes registered to vote. So it demonstrates that it is so important to get Negroes registered to vote in large numbers. It would be this coalition of the Negro vote and the moderate white vote that would really make the new South. And Johnson replied, that is exactly right. The common understanding was that Johnson, and including some people in the White House, that Johnson and King had no relationship with each other. Uh, White House aides, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who was the Iago of this story, <laughs> was whispering poison into Johnson's ear almost daily about King about his so-called communist advisor and, the, and also about his extracurricular activities as he was traveling around the country. So, and uh, we've already heard about the Kennedys and the Kennedys were listening to J. Edgar Hoover and every time they got together with King they were warning him to get away from that communist. So the relationship between King was a ballet of great intricacy, and what it revealed was that Johnson was not only a wheeler dealer, he was a great strategist and tactician, and Dr. King was not only an orator, he was a great strategist and tactician. Before Dr. King went in to have his first conversation with President Johnson on December the 1st, 1963, this is nine days after the assassination, he was being briefed by Clarence Jones, um, a black lawyer from New York. Clarence Jones was very well-to-do. He lived in Westchester County. He had married an heiress. And um, he said, Martin, you've got more in common with Lyndon Johnson than you do with me. Dr. King kind of looked at him, and he said, you are both from the same area, the South. You both love the South. You're, the white people and the black people eat the same food listen to the same music, have the same attitudes about going to church. So go, in, go into that meeting knowing that you and Johnson have a very common starting point. What he didn't tell him was that they also shared an absolute passion for equality. And... Um, that will come out as we talk about President Johnson. Uh, a final note on the 65, starting with Selma, that's the, March 7th, leading up to March 15th. There was a very, very critical time when after they had marched and been rebuffed, there was a great movement, including the black leaders, we got to march again. And a judge, a federal judge, a friendly federal judge, had ordered them not to march. And Dr. King was in a very difficult spot because uh, his people were telling him to march and he would be violating the judge's order. President Johnson sent Governor Leroy Collins who was his civil rights advisor, on a plane at midnight to go down and talk to Dr. King. 
And after they talked for a while, um, Dr. King, because Collins was telling him, don't do this, March. Talking to Wallace and to every Southern politician that he could, that he could get to. So Dr. King leads a march. They get to, the, did they get to the same point or about the same point? And they knelt to pray. And then they stood up and they sang, we shall overcome. And they turned around and went back. Here was a scene where Dr. King was using strategy, tactics, um, knowing what Johnson was about, knowing what they were trying to accomplish. And Johnson was doing the same thing. And it was uh, a day or two later when Johnson made that great speech. Thanks. So, so uh, they were both... I, I just Go ahead, one, sure. One, just one factual correction. Absolutely. Texas is not the South. I speak as a Texan. <laughs> nor is it the Southwest. Texas is Texas. <laughs> if, if was it I did I say Texas was a, several people was, here I, mentioned I Texas stand as part corrected. of the South. <laughs> Just one other quick point, if I may, and that is, it's my understanding that at some point in the signing of these laws, President Johnson recognized that that this was not a way to win the South, but that the South would be lost to Democrats for a generation. And the truly heroic thing of what he did is proceed and sign the laws, knowing that uh, exactly what has happened was going to happen, which is uh, the Nixon articulation of a Southern strategy, Kevin Phillips, and what we've seen in the 40 years since of, uh, of, of, of making it impossible for Democrats to carry the, the Old South. But the, president, but the president did what he... Uh, well, he said, he, he, said he, he said it. He probably going to lose this out. But I think President Johnson did what he felt that was right Absolutely. In, in his soul, in his heart, and in, in his gut. Uh, I will never forget that morning when he signed uh, the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. And to this day, I don't know why he did what he did. I've always wanted to, to ask someone. The morning that he signed the act, he invited James Farmer, Head of Corps and myself to meet with him. Not in the, not, it's a little anteroom off of the Oval Office. And maybe some, some of you here who are working with President Johnson and working on this, why on, he didn't invite uh, Roy Wilk and A. Philip Randolph or Dr. King. But I remember what he said to some of us. He said, go back, go back to the South and get them by the balls. That's what he said. He, he said it. And, and, and get them registered. Get them registered and turn them out to vote. Was he looking to a younger leadership? Was that what it was, perhaps? I, to the, this day, I don't know what was his motivation. Uh, I'm glad you used that quote. I left it well, out of my notes. <laughs> well, you don't sugarcoat uh, history, right? You don't you tell it. Uh, I think we're on a seven second delay. <laughs> Sorry. That's quite all right. Um, so we have this legislation passed in 64 and 65. Um, great changes uh, sort of flow from that, but clearly the story isn't over, and I think the movement begins to move in a, in a different direction, another direction. For one thing, it kind of begins to head north, and uh, the administration as well, and Joe Califano is sitting here, so I better get all of this right because... Um, he's a witness to it. The, the, um, it, it seems to me this is a, another phase of the movement begins at this time, and perhaps even another phase of the administration. Once the, the legislation of 64 and 65, that's passed, and then we enter this new, I think, this new phase. Um, this is the, the moment or around the time of the Howard University address. Uh, discussions of opportunity and affirmative action begin to emerge. Uh, maybe Taylor, could you shed some light on this for us? Uh, this, the, the idea that, that the, after the passage of legislation, the two pieces of legislation, there will be another important piece of legislation in 68, I think that the, the um, uh, 
focus of the administration begins to shift in another direction, and that perhaps is a function of the fact that the civil rights movement itself is, is changing, its, its orientation is changing. Wow. There was so much going on here. First of all, we can't leave the elephant out of the room that the very first combat soldiers landed yes. in Vietnam on the day of Bloody Sunday, almost within hours. So history was unkind to us. We did not have a period of respite to digest the meaning of these laws and these movements before we came, began to come apart over something else. However, these other laws kept marching and, and going. The one that I would like to draw attention to, because we're here about civil rights, and it is not considered a civil rights bill, but I consider it a civil rights bill. If you listen to those tapes, as soon as the Voting Rights Act passes, he's on the tapes and he's calling Ted Kennedy, where is my immigration bill? And he used a lot of epithets in there yeah. about the immigration bill, because he said the Southerners are, on, are prostrate, but they're not going to be prostrate law. We've, long. We've pushed, we pushed uh, the Voting Rights Act through cloture, and we can get it again on immigration only if we do it this rapidly. And it repealed basically the racist uh, immigration, uh, this is about legal immigration that we had had, the National Origins Act of 1924, which was scientific social Darwinism that, black, that blanked out most of the globe. And Johnson came up here to, to the Statute of, Liber Statue of Liberty, signed that thing saying, never again will the twin barriers of pre prejudice and privilege shadow the gate to freedom. Um, and the Immigration Reform Act of 1965 is a great piece of civil rights legislation if you're talking about the most essential meaning of civil rights, rights pertaining to citizenship, that nobody's too foreign to be a fellow citizen. And it has literally and figuratively changed the face of the country, along with the Civil Rights Acts and along with all the other things that Henry mentioned about the benefit for women. And as Dr. King said, history's wry paradox, that when black people became liberated, so was the white South. Uh, you never heard of the Sun Belt when it was segregated. Um, and all of these things began to change, and it was the spread of civil rights. It kept going, even though the political, um, the political differences began to surface over Vietnam and over the movement. There were people, let's be honest, there were people in John's uh, uh, civil rights group who opposed John marching at Selma, and then as soon as the Selma march was a success, even after that, uh, there were people who stood up in his meetings and said that if this federal wouldn't be any good. So there were people in the movement turning against the government because they were so frustrated. So there were lots of, liberal became a dirty word from the left before the right caught up and started demonizing it. So now we live in a very, very odd time when we're still living with the blessings of the Immigration Act and the blessings of the of the women's movement and uh, and and, and the Voting Rights Act, and all those things that are coming forward, things that were unimaginable. And yet the dominant word in politics today is conservative. And if you turn on the news tonight, you'll hear them repeat conservative thousand times. Nobody repeats the word liberal. And my view is it's because we have not, we're still so uncomfortable with race that we can't talk about the beneficial racial leg leg uh, legacy of that. And we're also so uncomfortable that we can't talk about all the other things the transformation of old age, the transformation of opportunities for women who couldn't go to West Point or any of these other things until the movement set all these things in motion. We have not been able to lay claim to those benefits for some reason, and for that reason we have paralyzed our politics. So um, things started happening in that period that we have still not digested and still not put before the American people in clear focus, enough focus for them to appreciate and have a true picture of the benefits and the liabilities and the responsibilities of government tackling severe societal problems because it, it, it was a blessing, it's still a blessing, but we're not very good at saying so. Could, could we just, thank you, and we would like to try to come to some of the more contemporary issues uh, shortly. Could we just try to say a, a, a couple of words or uh, share some thoughts on this, the fair housing? Is that something that perhaps well, Secretary Cisneros could? A real quick word. Mm -hmm. um, another tumultuous force unleashed, uh, perhaps by the sense of aspirations and expectations, mm -hmm. was the legacy of segregation as it impacted the North. Yes. So we had the problems of the cities. The urban crisis came to the fore, mm -hmm. Taylor, at this mm -hmm. very moment. And you had 
burning in places like Cleveland before the assassination of Dr. King mm -hmm. in 1968, when we know a whole host of places, including Washington, D.C., went up in flames. Watts. But Watts riots in 65, uh, Detroit, uh, and, and that was a function of segregation as it had been, as there were definable <coughs> lines, if you will, of people who moved from Alabama to Chicago and Alabama to Detroit and uh, f Florida and Georgia to New York City and Baltimore, et cetera. And, and, and the cities uh, were, 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 we discovered the urban crisis during this period. And President Johnson responded to that, creating a department of housing headed by the first African-American to be in the cabinet, Robert Weaver. And a fair housing uh, law in 1966 that opened up the opportunity for, for people to get fair housing in the cities and in the suburbs. So that was another set of factors that was at work uh, that made this national mm -hmm. in scope. Yes. And, and when we think about that period, I graduated from college in 1968, and, and it was, I suspect, as close to a period of civil war as we've had since the Civil War, uh, with the Vietnam War raging, President Johnson stepped down in March of that year, said he wouldn't run. Uh, Dr. King was assassinated in the spring. Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in June. The Chicago uh, civil disturbances in, 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 in the summer. Uh, that, was a, that was as hot as it could get. I mean, we think of these times as tumultuous, but that was, that was rough. And, and all of these things that we're talking about sort of came together mm -hmm. in, in, in those years. Actually, Con Congressman Lewis, could you say something about um, the kind of fracture in the civil rights movement that, that begins to happen in this period, which I think is, 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 is uh, sort of uh, all part of this discussion that, that Secretary Cisneros has laid out. I mean, there, there are significant fissures appear in the movement sort of, I guess, post-65, and, and they're going to have, I think, a dramatic impact, certainly on the movement, on the way that the administration um, uh, responds to the movement. Could you talk about that, sort of, I guess, around the time of Watts and then after that? S something happened. Uh, this sense of hope, mm -hmm. this sense of optimism. Uh, I think the Kennedy, Johnson years ushered in a period of great hope, a period of great expectation. And something just died. People became frustrated and disappointed. Many of the young people, the war in Vietnam, but even before the end, if there was this sense that we did all of this work, uh, that we were seeing people beaten and arrested and in jail, uh, we worked in Mississippi. More than a thousand young people, primarily white. Yeah. Some African Americans, some others, the primary young white people came to the South. They worked very hard, and they saw three of their colleagues uh, beaten, shot, killed. And then during the march from Selma to Montgomery, uh, on March 9th, a young minister, young white minister from Boston, James Reed, James Reed, went out to get something to eat with three other young ministers, and they were attacked by members of the Klan. He was so severely beaten, he died two days later at a local hospital in Birmingham. All of this set in this sense of disappointment. And, and you saw within the movement itself, Dr. King made the decision to go north to Chicago, and the SNCC people wanted to lay down the philosophy and, and the discipline of nonviolence. I was the chair. Mm -hmm. They uh, voted me out, and they said I was too non too nonviolent. I was too... Um, too tied to Dr. King. Dr. King was my friend. He was my leader. He was my hero. Uh, I met him when I was 18 years old in uh, 1958. He was my inspiration. And they said they needed someone to stand up to Dr. King, someone to stand up to Lyndon Johnson. I respected President Johnson, respected President Kennedy. Uh, I, I think that Lyndon Johnson probably been one of the most uh, committed and dedicated leaders in terms of civil rights, golden rights, fair housing. He was a leader. And he was not one of these politicians, in my estimation, that would put his uh, 
fingers up in the air to see which way the wind was blowing. Mm -hmm. And when people got in this way, he sort of said, this is my understanding, some of the historians may know better, that he had a conversation with his friend, uh, Dick Russell, Senator Russell, and he sort of told him to be quiet. I'm gonna get the civil rights bill through, I'm gonna get the, the voting rights through. And a lot of those Southerners didn't make a great deal of noise. They kept their peace, mm -hmm. they kept quiet. And that was leadership, yeah. bold, meaningful leadership. John, on uh, the Watts riot, mm -hmm tells us and the, what, what happened with Dr. King and with President Johnson tells us something about both of them and about history and what was going on. After the uh, Watts riots, after this goes to the death, no, this is the Watts riots. August 6 to 5. Yeah. President Johnson is down at the ranch, and uh, this is a Joe Califano story. He can correct me if I'm wrong, part of it. And the governor of California is out of the state, and the lieutenant governor needs to get troops moved from San Francisco to Los Angeles. Joe was new in the White House, been there a couple of weeks. President Johnson would not answer the phone at the ranch. He was in a deep, deep funk. Why? Because he cared so deeply about the civil rights laws and about these great society laws that he was moving around. And he saw in those flames, he thought maybe everything was going to go down the drain. It didn't. Dr. King reluctantly, because he was urged, went out to Watts while these riots were going on. Dr. King was booed by black radicals. That's where they had moved. Um, but neither, but both King, Johnson got out of his funk, and both Johnson and King continued to move forward with their programs, but it was going to be much, much tougher uh, because there was the riots and there was a white backlash to the passage of those two laws, and yet they kept going. I'd like to just try to turn to some more contemporary issues. Um, and this has come up in some of the discussions that we've had uh, today and even last night. Um, and I guess we can turn, maybe we can describe it as the culture of Washington today and how it is, is it different from what it was then? Um, and one of the things I, I also think is, and, and Congressman Lewis just alluded to this, is I think striking here is Johnson's willingness to take political risks, um, which I think is apparent. Um, do we have leaders today who are willing to take political risks? And let's think about that and then also put that in the context of the culture of Washington and the extent to which it has changed uh, from what it was in the early to mid-60s. Who would like to be, maybe Secretary Cisneros, perhaps you'd like to well, speak I, I, about this. Well, I, I think there are, there are people who are willing to take risks and be courageous. I think President Obama and the initiative on health care uh, some people f feel, I think, that uh, he should not have taken on health care, that, that, that um, the economy and, and two wars was enough to occupy him for the first term, and he concluded that he needed to use his political capital to make this kind of fundamental change. I think that's political courage. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's there. It's a very different and tough environment. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, it's clear there are people with political courage. Taylor, do you want to speak to that? I, just, I would just say this is an observation that, uh, well, two observations, Number, very short. Number one, when I first went to Washington, which is after, right after President Johnson went out of office as a young journalist, I'll never forget seeing people come out of government office buildings to sit on the curb and eat their bag lunches. That's a long way from the culture in Washington that you have today. Uh, number two, in this, in 64, 
both parties had ideological wings on both sides. Each party had a liberal wing and a conservative wing. Um, over 80% of Republicans in both houses, the House and the Senate, voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Um, the Democrats were spearheading it, of course, but they had a very large entrenched segregationist wing. Nowadays, and that turned on a dime, more so than I think it's given historical recognition, the partisan realignment, that the very first Southern Republicans sprang up uh, not to oppose the Civil Rights Bill because they had learned that the language of violence and the language of segregation was no longer respectable, but to cuss the government for doing it. Uh, and that became very, very prophetic in transforming us now where we have uh, a, a party of where the Democrats are, are perceived to be a party of biracial coalitions, but they're afraid to talk about liberalism because they think that that suggests too much race or too much something to lose elections. And the conservatives, so, so the, the parties now no longer have ideological balance and I, uh, on, on both sides. And I think that's a pretty big uh, difference in history. And, and the money plays a different role. Oh, yeah. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Uh, you're, you're in Washington. Well, so I, I think we lost something mm -hmm. in American politics. Yes. We need to find a way to uh, reclaim it. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my Washington office, I have a, a photograph uh, when the group of us came up on Capitol Hill on the morning of August 28, 1963, and we met with the Democrat and the Republican leadership uh, before we march on both sides, half the uh, House side as well as the Senate side. And you saw Everett Durkison there. Uh, be hard and very difficult. It's a different world. It's, it's a different world and different players. Uh, even before we march, we, we had meetings uh, in stating constant contact with the House leadership, the Senate leadership, both Democrats and Republicans. I, I don't think you will see that today. It's a different, it's a different world. There's a, there's a meanness. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what you call it. Can you identify when that, ha when that began to emerge? Well, I think some of it, uh, it just didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't want to talk about anyone in particular. But uh, when a certain person became Speaker of, of the House, I think that's what happened on the House side. I, I don't know what happened on, on, on the Senate side. Mm -hmm. But there is a meanness that um, we, we don't have this sense of respect for each other. Uh, something that's really died in American politics, and we, we got to reclaim it. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't respect each other. Uh, as Americans. It's not just in American politics, but we too quick to put people down because of their beliefs or their ideology. Mm -hmm. um, 47 years ago, when President Johnson spoke to a joint session of the Congress, leading up to that, it was this sense of that we're all in this thing together, this sense of righteous indignation when they saw what happened in Selma, or what they saw happening in Birmingham in 1963. Uh, we saw ourselves as one people. That right, was a minority, but we saw ourselves more as a nation, more as a family united together in a common cause. And we lost that. Johnson had, and King both, had an incredible sense of timing. When you do something, when you move. After those riots, the one in which Dr. King was killed. Johnson saw an opportunity. Joe Califano was involved in this and, and told this and told part of the story. But I'll precede it by saying what President Johnson told all the legislative liaison from every department of government after the 64 election. And he had this great big majority in both houses. And he told these guys who were going to go up and push these bills, he said, boys, this is the time to push all our chips into the ring. He said, right now, I just won by so many million votes. 
but next month the, the amount of people who support us will go down and it'll go down the following month and we need to move while there is the opportunity to move. He knew that he had to move then. But in Congress, one little example of what was starting to change, they sent a piece of legislation to the Hill that was going to involve uh, rat, it was going to involve rat control in the, uh, it was a bill to <clears throat> put up money to try to control vermin rats in the ghetto. And the Southerners in Congress turned that into a travesty with a little edge of racial epithets, saying, we're going to do that right, right now. And it was turning, the mood was turning in Congress because of the riots. And yet Johnson kept right on going and with Califano and others at his side, continued to pass legislation. But the combination of the riots, the backlash in the South, the war in Vietnam, um, it was difficult to pass huge pieces of legislation. Just a, a quick point, if I may, uh, and I know you're trying to go to the question period, but the question as to sort of the divisions in the Congress are in part due to the redistricting processes that have created more Republican districts and that are purely Republican districts and can only be in the, in the people who hold those seats can only vote one way on any given issue, similarly on the Democratic side, and then the money that disciplines people within their parties. But that is probably also a reflection of just how divided we are as a country. And it is a division that is based on precisely the issues we're talking about here in this panel, which are civil rights related issues. We have dramatic demographic changes going on in the country, a, an aging of a population that is increasingly worried about its social security and its entitlements and, 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 a, and a different population coming along behind that needs education of new immigrants and ethnically different people. And all of this is reflected in the way we vote and the way we behave politically. So we have these incredibly close elections. And it's probably going to get worse before it gets better because um, there are people who are fearful and there are people who are angry. Um, and the country's changing and look and color and language and national origin in so many different ways. Um, and and, and I, I, there was a hopeful moment there in the Obama election where we thought we were sort of beyond race, but we know we're not. Um, so I, 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 we, these very, it, it just points out that these laws are more important than ever because they create the framework in which society can mature and evolve. We have to have, had to have these laws. But they're also under threat. Uh, we have with us today Letitia Vandepew, who's a state senator from Texas, who's battling on the front ranks of efforts to change the Voting Rights Act, uh, to change the, the, the system of, of, uh, of, of, of creating districts. Um, there should be multiple new minority districts in Texas, given the growth in Texas, 90% of which was minority, and yet we know that the state of Texas is attempting to, uh, to, to change the, the redistricting process. What is, so, what's, what's also happening there is state by state, states are passing legislation to make it much tougher for poor people and minorities, poor minorities, to vote. Voter, right, voter ID? Elderly? Students? They're, well, but, but they're in states, the process and, of trying to reverse the voting rights. But it's act. not just the South. It's not just the American oh. South. Mm. More than 34 states are trying to undo the spirit and the letter of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 that President Johnson signed into law. Uh, and I've said over and over during the past few days, past few weeks, that the vote is precious. 
almost sacred. And, and we cannot let this happen in America. Thanks. Thank you. I, I think we Can would all agree with that. We're going to take some questions now, and then actually we will come back to Congressman Lewis for a last Great. word. Tom, first question. My name is Tom Johnson. I uh, worked with President Johnson for eight years. This is a question that uh, I wanted to ask uh, President Obama. I, I, w I don't think I will. But I think President Johnson would have been so proud that President Obama was elected. Elected after all the work that he and Dr. King had done to pass the civil rights laws, voting rights laws. I just wanted to know if you could tell me why President Obama has shown virtually no recognition or respect for President Johnson, and yet he perhaps would not have been in the White House today had it not been for the work of John Lewis and Martin Luther King and Linda Johnson. Who would like to answer that question? <laughs> well, I, th I think we all ought to take a, a, a quick shot at it. Since President Johnson left office, there has not been a single American president who has forcefully argued for a civil rights law of any kind, and there's been no president who has made a major issue of poverty in this country. And we heard this morning how poverty is uh, very much with us. Uh, the presidents see a change in mood in the country. Taylor, do you want to say something about this? Well, um, I don't think that I would want to talk about personalizing it uh, for President Obama. That is a whole different subject. But it is a, it is a shame of the country and of the Democratic Party uh, in particular that if you go to conventions, if you go anywhere else, President Johnson is uh, virtually an invisible figure. Not in Texas. <laughs> Not in Texas. Well, te in we Texas. know Texas is, uh, is special. <laughs> but you're proving my point. The exception proves the rule. But, but by and large, I think people, it, it, it is a problem. I think it's a historical problem. I think the country has still not digested the meaning of the policies and the politics of the 1960s. Yeah. We're still doing it subliminally. Uh, I remember President Clinton, when we were doing an oral history, he said, I can, I can predict with 85% accuracy how people will vote today by asking them one question. On balance, do you think the 1960s were good or bad for America? And if they say it was good, they're going to vote Democrat. If they say it was bad, they're going to vote Republican. And it's because, and President Johnson is caught up in that, in that, that's why I, I said I think we have failed to lay claim broadly enough to the, to the broad benefits of that uh, as they pertain to the, how our government can and should function. Well, I, I, I just think it's a shame and a disgrace as a nation and as a people and as a Democratic Party or whatever you want to call it, that we fail to recognize the contribution that Lyndon Johnson made to the larger society. And it shouldn't be just the responsibility of the state of Texas to, 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 to recognize them. Big as it is. No, no, I, <laughs> no, no, no. I've been very serious These about These things this. take time. It takes time for the country, as Taylor said, to, to, to digest. And uh, it, we just finished a World War II memorial. Uh, it, it took a long time to get a Franklin Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, and the, day, the moment will come when people will acknowledge, or partisans should drive the case for a, an appropriate Lyndon Johnson recognition in Washington. Well, we're doing our bit here in New right. York. That's exactly. Right. Okay. Is there another question, perhaps from a student? I see a hand right here. So, uh, yes, uh, good afternoon. I'm a student. Um, Could you tell us who you are? Yes, Philip Ellison. I'm a CUNY Honor student. Um, my question for the panel and the historians and, and Congressman Lewis. Um, if we're talking about contemporary issues and, and tying them to history, if, if I'm wondering what, uh, going through this process, what kind of foresight of conversations were going on between Dr. King or the people within the movement of what, um, how society, American society would look after passage of the voting rights and so forth. 
and especially in the sense of as we people argue that institutions have transformed over time. So if we're talking about three fifths and the battle for representation in the South, and then looking at New York uh, and upstate and and um, where prison, the prison urban population um, was counted upstate and counted um, essentially to allow upstate Republicans to have um, seven seats upstate, or if you look at the transformation from d just certain institutions in the sense of 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 how they've evolved and 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 how the prison industrial complex has happened. Could you? So, I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah, sorry. Could you just we're running low on sorry, time. Sorry. If you could just focus. Absolutely. On the so essentially, if, if looking what at like what was what what did the movement? What kind of conversations? What kind of foresight did did uh, everyone have or conversations you have looking at institutions evolve? when we have a black president and symbolism, but that we still, the, the black population has a lot of statistics and things against them. That's it. Okay. That's the only it. thing I would say, we've made a lot of progress. We've come a distance. You know, some people say this is the, the election of Barack Obama is the post-racial society, is the fulfillment of Dr. King's dream. The only thing I would say, uh, it's not the fulfillment of the dream, just a down payment. Uh, we're not there yet. We have not yet created a truly open society. There's too many people, if President Johnson could sit and speak to us today, he would say there's still too many people that are locked out, that have been left out, and, and left behind. Uh, it's a shame and a disgrace that we didn't pass it, the DREAM Act when we had the majority in, in the Congress. And no one is saying anything about it. You're right, Nick. No one is saying anything about poverty and hunger that still exists in American society. I, I, part of it, I think the American people are too quiet. We need to make some noise. We need to create that environment. John, whenever I talk at a school, I always ask this question. Is there any issue involving the school or involving public policy which would lead you to march to City Hall, to your congressman's office, and there is dead silence. Except they almost always say, if the draft was reinstated, we would, seriously, we would march. Um, I'm sure that is. I'm sure that is the case, um, <laughs> which is probably why. Well, never mind. Um, I just wanted to conclude with a final question for uh, Congressman Lewis. We've been talking about this, but it, I suppose it's kind of a two-pronged question. I'm going to pretend this is a presidential press conference. Um, on this, uh, I guess first is what is LBJ's legacy with respect to civil rights, and you've been we've been talking about this certainly. And then, are there lessons? <coughs> Uh, that those years hold for us today that we can walk out of here and think, okay, there are some things that we can apply to the present moment. The legacy of President Lyndon Johnson is very simple in my estimation. He freed and liberated a nation. Just think, before 1965, before 1964, those signs that said white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women, existed all across the South. People couldn't use places of public accommodation. Many of those symbols and signs had a psychological impact on whites as well as African Americans. Those signs are gone and they will not return. And our children, and their children won't see those signs in public places. They will only see them maybe in a book, on a video, or maybe in a museum. They are gone, and they will not return. The simple fact that people couldn't, you know, if, if it was not for the Voting Rights Act today, there would be no Barack Obama as President of the United States of America. That's part of the legacy of this man. And we need to state it. Less. We need to embrace mm -hmm. the changes, mm -hmm. embrace what Lyndon Johnson did. It's not just the civil rights, but health care and education, uh, so many other things he set in motion. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all of you.